Went straight into a tree. Bang, hit the water. <laughs> to this day, bless her, my mum still doesn't know. She probably will know when she watches this video. Hi, mum. <laughs> Blues and twos. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to another slightly different Monkey London episode. I'm not going to kind of get too much into world politics today. The only advice I could probably give to you guys if you're watching and you're stressing a little bit is try and reduce your mainstream media consumption. So Facebook, news, television as well. Obviously, it's quite, you know, it's important to kind of get an idea of, of what's going on. But what they're saying isn't what's always happening. So care for the loved ones around you. Just use a bit of logic and a bit of common sense. Obviously, we are doing a slightly different video today. I've got me, got me cushions. Thanks, mum. Love my birthday present. She bought me these lovely cushions. First video today we're going to talk about is my car history. A lot of you guys have been saying in previous videos we want to know about all your past cars and I've had a fuckload. Today we're going to go through them. I'm 16 years old, I'm living at my mum's. I've become 17. I'd start to do driving lessons with BSM. I passed my test. I think I did it in a, a one litre Vauxhall Corsa. And the guy always said to me, if you're gonna fail on anything, Mr. Monkey, you're gonna fail on speed, because I like to obviously put my foot down a little bit. I did my test and I actually managed to get a minor for going too slow, which was pretty ironic. But yeah, I managed to pass my test. My granddad, he left me 3,000 pounds, very kind of him as, as my inheritance. So I went out and I bought a Peugeot 106 Rally which was pretty cool for the day. It was a Mark 1 uh, 106 Rally, so it was the 1.3, it was black. Um, had all the red seat belts and the red carpets and the white wheels. I didn't actually do any modifications to it purely for the fact that I only had it two weeks, which I will tell you now. I'm not gonna lie, and I don't recommend being like this. You know, I was absolutely insane when I passed my test. I thought I was literally a rally driver. A friend of mine used to describe me picking him up on the way to college was like getting in a rally car. I kind of come around the corner, down through the gears, stop at the bus stop. <laughs> Before the door was even closed, he was in the car, we were flying on the way to college. I was pretty stupid back then, I used to just like overtake everything, it was just completely pointless because you'd end up in a traffic jam in the morning anyway and the cars would be sitting behind you, but yeah, it, it took quite a bit for me to kind of learn that you can't drive around like an absolute helmet. In the two weeks that I had the car, I managed to go through a speed camera, completely irresponsible, but that is what I, I was like when I was 17. In between getting a bit of paper to say I've got to go to court about the speeding ticket, I actually wrote my car off and I had the car only two weeks. So this was a pretty, uh, pretty sort of famous record amongst my friends. I was the, the person that had the car, the, his first car for the shortest time. And yeah, I tried to do a massive handbrake turn. I was coming down quite a sort of notorious road that's got 180 degree bends. And like I said, I thought I was Colin McRae and I cut, you know, I'd seen him do it on the, on the rally video. So I come around the corner, yanked the handbrake. And it was, to be fair, quite a sick little slide. I kind of got halfway around the corner. Being a little front wheel drive car, the car locked up, um, gripped up, and then went straight into a tree. <laughs> After I crashed my 106 rally, I actually bought a little Fiat Cinquecento because I needed a cheap little car just to drive around with, with cheap insurance. The fuel used to come out of the out of the fuel cap, so you could never put more than three quarters of a tank in, which was pretty interesting. That was a cool little car. I did loads of sort of funny little things in it. I had a little bit of a break because I had, didn't have any money, so I had to save up to get another car, and I actually went and bought a 205 GTI, a 1.6 on Pepper Pots. I think I paid roughly about a grand for it at the time. It was quite scruffy, it was red, but it was like 50 shades of red. I mean, it was like orange, maroon, I mean, it was every shade of red you could possibly imagine. One day, we used to have this event at my college called Egg and Flower Day. Basically, the last day of college, everyone would come in, they'd buy eggs and flowers. It used to get so bad that they'd actually ban the sale of egg and flowers and all the local shops so I'm coming out of the college driveway I've got two eggs in my hands like that and I'm driving the car 
and I got my friends sort of all laughing next to me and I go to throw two eggs at a, a chap walking past. This is my moment, this is my perfect moment. And as I do it, like that, I pull down on the steering wheel. And as I do it, I go up the, up the curb and there's a little tree with a post holding the tree up and I literally smash into this post and it rips the front of the car off. <laughs> Not so bad that I couldn't drive the car, but yeah, it was really badly damaged. My mum would have literally killed me because I'd only just got the car. And obviously I'd had the problem with the first car. Um, so yeah, what I did was I'd drive all the way back with the bumper, like the whole front of the car literally hanging on the floor. When I got back, there was actually a breaker's yard just down the road for my mum. So I went in there and I was like, obviously trying to find a 205 GTI bumper is probably not an impossible. Luckily he did, but he only had a diesel, which has obviously got a black front bumper, very different, no fog lights, no sort of little uh, chin spoiler. Very kindly, I gave the guy 50 quid. He bodged the bumper on for me. Obviously it looked completely or radically different from the old one because it was a full solid black bumper now instead of a GTI one. To this day, bless her, my mum still doesn't know. She probably will know when she watches this video. Hi mum. Yeah, that was me and I do apologise. Irresponsible young lad and, and those were the things that happened. Eventually the head gasket went on the 205 and I ended up selling it to a mate for cheap. After the 205 GTI I had this. That was kind of my first entry into um, rear wheel drive before I got the KP61 which was a, and that was a cool car. It wasn't really set up for drifting um, but I started kind of learning how to do burnouts and doing sort of basic um, like first gear skids in it. What did I buy after that? Oh, I bought a Starlet 1.34 EFE. It's sporty UK version. It had all the little TTE rear spoiler, back box, TTE front splitter, which I acquired. And then a friend of mine bought a Starlet GT Turbo. And this is when all my Japanese sort of mad obsession with cars start to go crazy. I'd never even heard of a GT Turbo, let alone, let alone seen one. Took me up the road in it and like, what? Watch! Oh my god, I was just literally obsessed with turbo cars from that point forward. The minute I got back, funnily enough, I actually contacted Fensport. I spoke with Adrian and the chap that used to work there with the GT4 called Tony, and I ordered a front cut. The front cut's basically a starlet sort of cut in half, so you've got all the front bit, basically everything you need to do a full turbo conversion. I had a friend of mine called Kevin who I used to deal with, and he very kindly helped me do a 40 FTE turbo swap. As you guys can imagine, going from 80 horsepower to 140 suddenly, it was just like the car literally felt electric. I got in it and I'd never sort of kind of felt the speed before. This was kind of like my entry world into the sort of into turbo motors and yeah it was absolutely mental i started doing a few little bits and bobs to it like all your sort of basic breathing mods and it was pretty sick i put a hybrid turbo on there got it up to i think just over 200 horsepower um, but i kind of concentrated more on the on the chassis and the handling characteristics of the little polyurethane bushes i changed all the arms i had a, a, a sort of full uh, welding roll cage that was a really really cool car i ended up getting some nice little enki black wheels for it and it was really sort of sleepy it was 200 brake really well set up the, the windows were slightly um tinted so you kind of couldn't see the roll cage and stuff and yeah it was a really fast little car one evening i was a little bit stupid i was getting my wheels refurbished by my friend james he lent me some different wheels so i had 16s on the front and 14s on the back, they were just temporary wheels. John got into a bit of a race situation, as you say, and uh, yeah, he went round, round a corner underneath the bridge and it was really slippery and obviously there was the tyres in the back weren't very good and the front had 16s and decent tyres, there was just no grip. And yeah, he came round a corner, the back swung out and he went straight into a, into a wall. And um, yeah, and literally wrote the car off instantly. It was completely and utterly battered. You guys are probably gonna hate me after this. I just end up c killing all the cars, but to be fair, most of them did get repaired. And you know, when, when you're young and you're trying to sort of learn learn your limits, you know, especially when, when you love cars and you love driving fast, they can be a little bit dangerous. So do, you know, do try and be really careful. I was probably very lucky 
uh, not to have any sort of serious, serious issues. But yeah, now certainly down the line, I'm, I'm a lot more sensible. Now, John, on the other hand, is a bit of a bell end, but that's a story for another day. After that, I actually bought a little Starlet GT Turbo, so an official, <coughs> excuse me, official EP82, which I bought off a chap. It had loads of issues with it, like the clicking CVs and exhaust leaks and crack manifold. Um, so I bought that really cheap, fixed it up, and spent quite a bit of money on that, and doing the same sort of thing I did to my old one. And uh, yeah, and that was a good little car. And funnily enough, I en actually ended up swapping that for a KP61, which is now a very expensive car. It was green, and it had a full AGE silver top, so 16 valve, on uh, Makumi carbs as well, so it sounded really cool. It had a T56 gearbox, so an A86 gearbox, and A86 running gear as well. I actually ended up getting that car and the Starlet I originally built featured in a magazine. I think it was Japanese Performance. I then took the BMW E30 and I part exchanged it for a Subaru Impreza WRX. Um, which I had for about six weeks. Someone actually went into the back of that car, so that for once it wasn't actually my fault, but I was parked up at, a, well, I was waiting at a junction and a car behind just literally skidded into the back of the car. I actually got an insurance payout on that and then I went and bought a Subaru Impreza Wagon STI. <laughs> That was a pretty cool car. I started again playing around with the mods. I think I got up to about sort of 350 horsepower. And the head gasket, fun enough, went on that car as well. And I decided at the time to, I think I just fixed it and then I sort of got rid of the car. Next major leap from there was a R32 GTST. Welded diff, matte black paint. It was kind of, I think I paid about two, two and a half grand for it. So quite cheap back in the day. The Skylines used to be a lot cheaper. And that's where John really started to practice um, doing some drifting. So at night time, I used to obviously give him the keys. I'd stay at home. The car was really cool and, and it, it wasn't powerful. Very, I mean, it was about 230 horsepower, 240 horsepower. Um, so yeah, not massively powerful. So you kind of had to rely on your skills to get it going obviously arguably it's a lot easier to drift a car like that with a long wheelbase than it is a short wheelbase car i tried doing a bit of drifting in the kb61 but uh, apart from sort of first gear stuff in car parks i couldn't really get the hang of it and i was scared as well because the car was quite old and quite expensive after that i bought a s2000 i started working as a car dealer working up in london so i started making a little bit of money i've actually had two s2000s so i should know this fact what do they come with stock GT as well, so it had the hard top, it had some wheels on it and a few little mods. I actually worked for a car dealer for about eight years up in London, so in that time we had a huge amount of part exchange, like uh, part exchanges coming in, so a lot of cheap cars that I, I would kind of buy off my boss and I'd drive around in them. We had a little um, Civic automatic that came in, a little 1.4 Civic, and I bought that for about 50 quid off my boss. And then we spent the next sort of four weeks um, green laning it. John used to take it up to MOD land. There used to be this huge place we could go, and it was quite literally like a, a rally rally track. But it went on for miles and miles and miles. And we, we spent quite a few years in this place just ragging cars around, doing jumps. A shame, really, I'd never filmed stuff back then because this, the, I mean, the comedy moments we had were literally unprecedented. I had my mate Dale in the car. We're driving a little EP91 Starlet, and we're ragging it around this all this land, and it's been quite wet. We're coming down the hill. When I say a puddle, it literally looked like a lake okay so we're coming down the hill and I'm doing about 60 miles an hour over the bumps over the dirt and I look at Dale and he's just like don't do it and I'm like okay <laughs> so I basically come down and slow down I go I go around this massive lake I mean it is it's literally like a, a lake anyway we're off into the woods come back about 20 minutes later back to where we were and I see the lake again and I just think fuck it I'm gonna do this so I drop it into third Wah -wah! fly and flying down the hill flying down the hill and then bang hit the water <laughs> ah! 
car just stops. <laughs> literally stops. I didn't really understand hydro locking at this point. So we're sitting in the middle of the water. The water's literally lapping up to the door. Instinctively, I just try and turn the car on because I'm a Muppet and instantly it hydrolocks the engine. So that's where water basically goes into the engine and obviously the, the pistons can't compress water and it, it locks the engine. But my mate comes down with a Nova and tries to pull us out for about 30 minutes, so much so that his clutch starts to slip. So we, we, end, we end up giving up. Eventually we got another mate to come down and literally after about 20 minutes of ramming the car, trying to get it out, we managed to finally pull it out. Um, obviously there's the whole car is full of water and the lads literally towed John to a scrapyard nearby and we literally just left the car outside because as you can imagine it was pretty fucked. There are a huge amount of stories and a huge amount of cars I'm probably forgetting that we used to take up to these green lanes. Anyway, I digress. I had the S2000 for probably about four or five months. It was a really nice car. Obviously I was working and living in London so you know when I had a bit of free time uh, I used to put the roof down and kind of cruise about and it was pretty pretty nice car to enjoy after that i actually spotted a mad r32 gtr 600 horsepower one with a fully forged engine roll cage apex c power fc um, ssr wheels bigger brakes i mean it was a really big spec car he chucked it up for i think 10 grand which is really going to sort of show you guys how cheap these cars used to be i mean you used to be able to buy a stock r32 gtr slightly ropey one for about four to five grand. That's literally what they were going for. You couldn't give them away. On the off chance, I just messaged the guy and said, hey, I've got this S2000, you know, do you want to do a straight swap? Because I didn't really have any more money to put on top. And surprisingly, the guy said yes. So I drove the S2000 up there with Eddie and um, yeah, met the guy, did the deal. And the first thing he said to me, he goes, his dad came out to me, he goes, please, can you be really careful? I'm actually petrified about my son having this car, about having the Skyline. And the son was like, whatever you do, do not press that button. And it was the, the button to basically disengage the four wheel drive, turn it into real drive mode. So literally, I've been doing a few skids at this point. I thought I was a bit of a don. So as I've left the guy's house, <laughs> flick the switch, literally 100 meter burnout down the road, literally lighting the rear wheels up. Obviously 600 brake, you've got a lot of power to play with. This was a very cool car. Like I said, I started to learn to drift and it had rear wheel drive mode. <laughs> The GTRs do drive slightly differently in rear-wheel drive mode compared to a normal rear-wheel drive Skyline because obviously there's a bit more weight over the front so it does change the characteristics of the car. street racing every Sunday we used to go up to near the Excel building which is kind of near city airport in London where they'd have all these kind of very quiet dual carriageways away from the city and we used to have these absolutely mental events I mean for over a sort of two years we used to go up and just have these crazy crazy adventures we kind of start at Ace Cafe I think 11 o'clock on a Sunday night and we'd go up the North Circular and kind of make our way up to Docklands. We used to get about two or three hundred cars coming. It was quite literally like something out of Fast, Fast and Furious. But there was a guy that turned up with an R34 GTR, thousand horsepower, proper like mental spec car. Um, but obviously, being in the day, it was kind. Of, it was full of stereo. It had like a mad sort of um, stereo install inside it, and he had 19-inch wheels. I had 17s, and mine was all stripped out. We decided to have a race and. It was quite literally like Fast and Furious because there were no cars and it was a very quiet part of London um, and obviously it was 
kind of two, three o'clock in the morning, we kind of sort of owned the road as it were. Um, so you'd have a huge crowd of people by the sort of start line. There'd be a long dual carriageway down up to a roundabout, and then you'd kind of go around the roundabout and come back. But it was really, really long. Probably like a good sort of a good mile long. Uh, obviously, I've got rear-wheel drive mode, so I think to myself, this guy's got 400 horsepower more than me, or 360, whatever it was. Um, it's probably best if I do a little burnout just to warm the tyres up. So I put it into rear-wheel drive mode. Eight grand, bang on the brakes. Did I just do that? Anyway, I come off, we line up into four-wheel drive mode, I pick it, you hear the differentials lock, and that's it. And I just think to myself, this guy's got so much horsepower, I am just going to literally launch it flat out off the line. So like I said, Ali puts his hand up, puts his hand up. I'm literally eight grand on the accelerator. I let off the clutch, the car just launches, literally launches straight ahead. By this point, I'd already gained like four or five car lengths on the R34, because his car's obviously pretty heavy. He's got loads of stereo, and I don't think he was probably quite as insane as I was. I'm four or five cars ahead, and then I'm just literally flat out. So much so that I am just smashing it through the gears so quickly, pretty much crunching through every gear, just because I'm trying to get away. And all I can hear behind me is this fucking R34 sucking me towards it. The turbo noises coming off this thing was obviously a thousand brake. You can hear a lot of intake noise. <laughs> I just keep my foot firmly planted, cracking every single gear, flames pouring out the bat, and then by the end of it, I'm about one car length ahead. Just beat him. Bang, give a cool blow to the jaw. Bang, give a cool blow to the jaw. Bang, give a cool blow to the jaw. Leave an every MC down on the floor. Literally everyone goes wild. They can't believe that my sort of underpowered R32 has actually managed to stay in front of this R34. Um, so yeah, the other guy, we kind of come around, go down the dual carriageway, the other guy comes beside me, gives me a little nod, so give a nice little thumbs up. There's always kind of nice attitudes in the car community, and we decide to go for another run. So yeah, exactly the same thing, we go back round, crowds open, go back to the thing, I do a little rolling burnout again to get some more uh, temperature into the tyres, and exactly the same thing again, Ali puts his hand up, I'm eight grand on the limiter, this, the guy also realises he's got to do a really big start this time, he fucking goes eight grand on the limiter, we were both... <laughs> Bang, hands come down once again, just the lightness of my R32 car just launches ahead. This time the race is really on, he is not messing about this time. So I am literally, if you thought I was breaking the gears last time, I'm changing gears so quickly now that I might as well not even use a clutch. Literally destroying the gearbox. Pretty stupid, but I just wanted to see if I could beat this guy. We get about three quarters of the way down and he's slowly pulling on me, but at this point he just realises John is probably insane and he backs off and then yeah, we get over the finish line about seven car lengths ahead. And yeah, what an experience. I could everyone was just going mad. It was like something out of Fast and Furious. I'm not making this up, but it's literally how it went down. Needless to say, I had actually broken my gearbox. I'd lost I hadn't lost third and fourth gear, but even if I was changing with the clutch, third and fourth gear were crunching. The story doesn't actually Actually end there. going to reference a different Skyline because actually after this happened I actually went home went to bed and nothing happened. John on the other hand told me about a story of another Skyline very similar car but it was different. On a similar evening he was driving back from London it was about four in the morning and he was taking his friend back to Guildford. John's dad bless him used to live in Battersea so he knows the roads around there very well so that the roads kind of leading from London down back to sort of Surrey there's a nice long motorway. First bit of it is all 50 mile an hour so obviously it's four in the morning there's literally nothing around it's basically it is a motorway they do have this 50 restriction for a good sort of I think about 10 miles and and they got speed cameras and obviously John knows the area very well he knows where every single speed camera is and he decides to basically see how fast he can go in between each speed camera so he gets the first speed camera slows down to 50 miles an hour goes through the speed camera drops into second bang bang give a cool blow to the jaw bang give a cool blow to the jaw bang give a cool blow to the jaw let me get seat down on the floor bang third fourth fifth gets up to let's say extremely high figures 
Next B camera comes, brakes back down, down through the gears. In a second, but off we go again. John finally gets to the last speed camera, obviously slides back down, goes through it, and as he goes through it and comes out the other side, he looks behind him, and there's a Ford Mondeo, like, flat out, and it goes straight through the speed camera, flash, flash. John's like, what, what is this guy doing? Next thing, the, the car comes up behind him, blues and twos, oh, it's the police. Shit, man, yeah, John is pretty scared. John pulls over. Obviously, he's been ragging his car. The turbos are probably glowing. He doesn't want to turn it straight off, so he gets out. And uh, obviously, the car's like ba 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 ba. The two chaps in the police car, undercover police car, get out, and they're like, "Can you turn that off? You can't, because it's it, you need." And they're like, "We don't care." So the guy walks over, grabs the key, pulls the key out. Obviously, the turbo timer kicks in, so the car's still running. So I'm already off to a bad start because they can't even hear themselves thinking. Um, anyway, we turn the car off. And the guy, they are not happy. The guy goes, you, what the fuck do you think you're doing? We have been doing 110 miles an hour, flat out for 10 miles. You've been stopping for every fucking speed camera and we still couldn't keep up with you. That's literally what they said. John didn't realize the whole time he'd been being, well, they'd been trying to tell him. John was very apologetic. It was four in the morning. Needless to say, it wasn't a responsible action to take, whatever anyone says. Um, but the roads were very quiet, which they kind of sympathise with. To be fair, they were quite nice. I had a chat with them for sort of 10 minutes, and they kind of left it in the balance. They kind of left me a bit on edge. They said at the end of the conversation, you might hear from us in court, you might not. So I kind of drove back to, to my mate's house with my tail between my legs and gave him a lift back. And luckily, praise the Lord, they were really nice. Nothing ever came of it. Anyway, back to the other R32. The gearbox completely got destroyed. We ended up taking the gearbox all out at work and loads of springs and metal and all this crap came out of it. And at the time, didn't really have the money to fix it. Obviously, I was quite tight on my wages when I was selling cars. Um, so in the end, I actually sold the car for nine grand to a guy in the army actually and he took it to Germany. I think he was stationed out in Germany and he ended up taking the car out there and that was the last time I saw of it I think. I'm sure he then sold it to someone else and they started doing loads of bits to it and I can't really remember what happened to it after then. I need to say, really really sick car that and that's why I've always had a, a real sort of soft spot in my heart for the, um, for the R32 GTRs. Oh my god I'm missing so many cars out of this. Two BMW E36. M3s as well, both saloons as well, so super rare and they're really expensive now. The first one was a Daytona Violet M3 with a load of nice bits in it that a friend of mine actually um, did a load of work on. That was a 3 litre single Vanos, then I had an Evo 3.2 saloon in Boston Green after that, which I did quite a few bits to. I ended up selling that to a guy who took it to the Nürburgring and he actually wrote it off of the Nürburgring, bless him. Next up, I had this really cool R32 uh, GTST with a 1JZ. Kind of bought it as a bit of a project back in the day. I mean, I got the car cheap, it wasn't running and I probably took on more than I could chew at the time and I, I didn't actually manage to get it on the road running properly. Someone actually offered me six grand for it and I'd only paid, I think, about four for it. So at the time, I thought, fuck it, I, I, I could do with a bit of money. After that, I actually managed to arrange a new deal with my boss because I was the top, you know, there was only sort of three of us selling, but I was literally smashing the sales. I used to do 80 to 90 hour weeks at this place. I mean, quite literally, I live there. At this point, I kind of moved a little bit away from the Japanese cars. I'd never really had kind of luxury cars in my time. Um, and obviously living in London and, you know, being around girls and stuff, it's, you know, sometimes you kind of want to get, you want to be a bit of a Flash Harry. You know, now I'm very opposite of that. I don't like to be a Flash Harry, but I guess you've got to kind of go through that stage to, to understand it. So then I bought this rather nice BMW, 330 convertible which was about five years old at the time so after that I actually went back to the Jap and I bought a, a Mitsubishi Evo FQ 400 so quite a rare car in the day was a little bit problematic. I kind of, I'd been used to having the R32 and I think they're a bit, maybe a bit more robust or just built with a bit more strength or rigidity in mind. And I started kind of doing all these mad launches with it. After two weeks, I'd done the clutch. Four weeks after that, I did the gearbox. Then I did the clutch again. By this point, I probably spent like five or six grand on the car. I went to this. I don't know why I did this because it's really not my cup of thing. And I absolutely hate these kind of things now. But like I said, you probably have to go through this stage to to understand it. Range Rover HST. It was the cheapest one in the country. And I think I bought that in the trade for about 20 and it was an absolute dog. In reality, I probably couldn't have afforded a proper HST, but I really wanted one. Got a coach all the way from here to Leeds to buy it. So by the time I got there, 
I couldn't really be bothered to get the train back, so I decided just to wing it. Anyway, that car was absolutely terrible. It was a 4.2 supercharged. I'd never seen MPG so bad in my life, and the car wasn't even particularly quick. I had that for about four weeks, five weeks, and I realized I didn't really like it, and I managed to go and swap that for an SL55 AMG, which was a really, really nice car. Obviously, they were great value for money. They used to be about 100,000 pounds when they were new, and I found a nice dealer, and I showed him around the car. I said to him it was a little bit scruffy, but you know, to be fair, he kind of just wanted it for a customer. Um, so we ended up doing a straight swap and the Mercedes I bought was lovely. I think it was about 50,000 miles. Sexy number plate, which I have in my drift cars. I did actually do a few bits to it. I got it up to about, I think just under 550 or 560 horsepower. That was it really, I cruised about in the car for quite a bit, really enjoyed it, obviously a hard top which was fantastic in the winter and a convertible for the summer, you know it's got a, a metal tin top. A friend of mine then really liked the Mercedes so much so that he offered me a really good price for it and I ended up actually selling it because I, I was in making a little bit of profit. At that point I actually bought a Cat C Range Rover Vogue, very random, it was a 2008 and it was about 2012 so as far as Range Rovers goes it was very cheap and it was very um and it was still very new and the car was cool we facelifted it we put all the new led lights on it um, we put the newer shaped wheels on it obviously we changed all the front and fixed all the the stuff from the damage from the front end damage the car was an absolute fucking nightmare i used to go down the road and it used to go into like um demonstration mode so it used to start flashing all the lights so much so that i actually got pulled over in in king's road once by the old bill saying that i was impersonating a police car and I actually said, no, I've actually just converted this car to facelift and we haven't sussed the wiring out yet and the, the lights are going crazy. In the end, another friend of mine really liked the car and um, he gave me 25 grand for it. So I made five grand. It cost me 20 grand to basically buy it and fix it and he offered me 25. And um, yeah, I, I took the money. At this point, I kind of got the um, sort of flashy luxury car thing out of my system. I realized that wasn't really what I was about. And I decided I loved drifting. So at that point, I sold the car. And then I went and got a JZX90 Cresta from a chap in Scotland. And that was pretty cool. I flew all the way to Scotland to buy it, met the guy. And it had been through a few hands and stuff, needed a few bits doing to it. But it was really cool. That's when I started to kind of get back into the drifting. I used to go out at night and have a little bit of fun. An old friend of mine called Lex, who I'd known for a long time, he actually ran the thing at Santa Pod, the drift days at Santa Pod. So he gave me a ring and said, why don't you come down? Why don't you try and actually do a drift day rather than messing about, you know, constantly going right? What I actually found when I got to the drift day was I couldn't actually drift left because John had been doing roundabouts for so long, he couldn't actually go the other way. So he probably spent half the day just trying to do a skid going to the left. Really, really good day. I kind of started off in the pens, you know, just doing burnouts and messing about, making loads of smoke. Oh, London. kind of came over and said come on mate you know you've got you've probably got the skills to go on the the big track and try and link it why didn't you try it so you kind of you pushed me into it forced me onto it very frustrating i was probably spent two hours spinning and getting really really eggy and then by the end of the day i don't know what happened just i think the end of the day it just kind of clicked and i started getting the transitions and then in the last hour i was linking the entire track and just the the, the dopamine the endorphins the feeling you get from drifting and connecting it just, I can't even describe guys, it was the best thing and from that point forward I was hooked. <laughs>
another drift day at Santa Pods. The third drift day I ever did was the British Drift Championship license day. So I literally ran before I could walk. We started going out and going out. This was literally my third drift day, but luckily for me, it started raining. So I started just going round and round. Obviously it's raining, you haven't got to change your tires. So I sat on the track for three to four hours, just non-stop linking it. And I just, I picked it up so quick. So much so that we came to do the license. And I think there was about, I'm not trying to sort of say I'm some sort of fucking amazing guy, but there was about 35 people. And I think two of us or three of us actually got the license. One more drift day at Santa Pods, so that was my fourth drift day, and then my fifth drift day was literally round, or whatever round it was, of BDC at Lydon Hill. That was pretty crazy. I went to BDC completely unprepared. I'd never actually done a, I don't think I'd actually done a tandem with someone, or maybe I did one at Santa Pod, but I wasn't used to tandeming with people. We did a little bit of practice. I was proper sketchy. Obviously, I'd never drifted on a massive track like this. I'd never actually been on a racetrack. Luckily for me, what I thought was like, it started raining, and I thought to myself, shit, all I've done so far is drifting in the rain at Teesside. So we do our first um, qualifying run. I come flying down the hill thinking I'm fucking Dago Sato. I go for a big fucking Scandi flick. I don't think I've even don't even think I knew how to do a Scandi flick. I just seen them do it on TV, so I thought I'm gonna do this. As I go for the flick that way, with the idea of flicking that way and coming back that way, I flick too much that way, and I don't even make the corner. So the corner goes round like that. I flick the car here with a, a view to do that, and I end up just like that, and I go like that <laughs> off the track. And then the back of the car smacks into this massive like water filled basically like a concrete barrier missed the back wheel by about that much but the car i find some pictures it literally looked like a bmw compact anyway i managed to get out of the sand out of the mud onto the track and i then although the run didn't count i just fucking went for it and i went round the corner down the wall, smack my lights off, lovely transition, back up on the corner, and then did a lovely sweeper with all my lights and all my bumpers hanging off the back. I did get a round of applause, and funny enough, I actually did win the hard charger for that event, because people were kind of proud that even though I crashed, I kind of got back on the track and, and, and did it. Run obviously didn't count, I then went and did another qualifying run, and that put me in the top 32. Then came to the competition, so I lined up, I can't remember what car it was, I lined up with someone, we, we went down and I started drifting and I looked back and the guy wasn't there. His car had actually broken down on the line. And so I got put through to the top 16, I, I jammed it. The same thing happened, I came down with the next guy, we went for, we went to do a run. Once again, I looked back, the guy's not with me, his car's broken down. Um, so now I'm into the top eight. So I, how have I managed to do this, man? So I'm in the top eight and I think we have to go and do one practice run because it's after lunch just to kind of get back into the swing of things. So anyway, I come down the track, to be fair, I do a nice little entry and I do a nice little drift, but halfway round, my car just loses all the power. Just completely disappears. The guys who were watching said that there were sparks coming out of my exhaust, and I was like, that's random. So we go back in, we, can't, we check around the car, we can't visually see anything, we crank the boost up just to try and overcome it. Anyway, I go back onto the straight, put my foot down, and nah, the car is completely dead, has no power. So at this point, I have to, I have to forfeit, and... Um, and luckily I actually got 8th position, so somehow I didn't actually do any battles, but I managed to become 8th. Well, what actually happened was, is the exhaust wheels on both my twin turbos, because I still had twin turbos at this point, they'd actually fallen off. Once we actually took the downpipe off and looked inside the turbos where you'd normally see the exhaust wheels, they were literally missing. After that, like every drifter who's done one drift day, I decided that four or 350 horsepower wasn't enough. So I decided to do a um, big single turbo swap and make it 600 brake like you do because everyone needs 600 brake. <laughs>
We ended up putting a pretty big HX35 on it, a new manifold, new downpipe, new injectors. We put a standalone ECU on it. Um, got it mapped, I think it made just over 600 brakes and now the car was pretty potent. And then when it did one more drift day at Lydon Hill, first two laps were just nuts. I'd never had 600 brake, the car was pissing out smoke out the back, it was just crazy, what an experience. Unfortunately came out the last corner and then as I was going down the straight with my foot flat to the floor it detonated. Um, because of a bad map and yeah the, unfortunately the car exploded a massive chunk came out of the piston in fact I've actually got the piston if I go and get it now you guys can see there's quite a big chunk missing out of it there and at this point really the car needed a full forge rebuild unfortunately we didn't actually get to a stage of actually repairing the car um, I actually ended up selling the car in bits to Sean and then I went and bought a JZX90 Cresta which was the green one which some of you guys will probably remember as one of the first cars on the channel I went to meet a nice chap in Ireland called Chris <laughs> came back again that was pretty mad mad spec I, I kind of worked out it was better to buy a JZX with all the modifications done or lots of stuff done to it rather than me spending 20 grand and I brought it back and I started doing a few drift days in it it was pretty potent <laughs> Um, about maybe 550 horsepower at the time and obviously two Jay-Z bottom end, one Jay-Z head, so 1.5 Jay-Z. a wall at um, Birmingham Wheels and I actually found it really hard to get a bumper. <laughs> One day Lex kind of rang me up and I had a long chat with me and he said look you know as much as you want to drive the JZ90 and it looks cool and it sounds fantastic it's not the best car to get seat time because it's quite fragile. Lex very wisely advised me I'd be best to buy a Sora 
or something like a Sora, which is a bit cheaper, they're a bit more robust, and if I kind of crash it and do stuff to it, it's not really gonna be a problem. So, as you guys can probably tell, I followed Lex's advice, and I went and bought a green Toyota Sora R154 uh, manual swap, and a 1JZ as well, off a nice chap called Ricky. I paid three and a half grand for the car, I mean, you can't buy a Sora for that sort of money. You'll remember I actually bought the car, and on the same day, I took it straight to Lydon Hill, and, um, and started drifting it. I mean, the car was an absolute pig. It needed loads of stuff doing to it, but we managed to just about get away with it. On the way back, very stupidly, me thinking that I had 600 brake, I decided to do a clutch kick in fourth gear at 70 miles an hour. Why, I don't know. I didn't have 600 brakes, so I certainly couldn't sp sp span the wheels up. Bang, big thump, car loses all the power. I'm like, what the fuck? And I hear this massive met metallic sound going from underneath the car. So I pull over, Jamie gets out and he's like, mate, your pulley just went past my windscreen. And the crank pulley had literally sheared off the block. As much as it was funny and the guys thought I was an absolute numpty, I said to them, everyone else, just you crack on, there's no point you waiting here. And I ended up sitting there for six hours waiting for the REC with no battery in pitch black. It's a story for another day. As you guys saw, I mean, I don't really need to go through the saw. You can go and watch all the drift diaries to kind of see what happened to that car. But that really was the car that taught me everything or everything that I don't know today. <laughs> Do some twinning. I got my camera on board as well, so we get some nice shots of you.
Man, I'm not coming near this car, it looks so fucking clean. Yeah, I had an amazing time in this car. I traveled the length and breadth of the country pretty much until my money ran out. That's when I had to get back into car sales a bit more and kind of find other avenues of making money. Hence, I'm doing things like the merchandise now. Mrs. Monkey, bless her. She started having a few goes in the Sora. Her skills were literally next level. And I promise you guys, I'll definitely get her back on the track as soon as I can afford it. ML, unfortunately, through no fault of her own, uh, wrote the saw off. We just had a crashing! Don't worry about it, man. It's the saw, it bounces off. So from there, we went and bought the S14. You guys remember the little red S14 that I had for about six months? And that was a cool car as well. Very basic mods. Pretty simple S body. I think it I think it had stock lock to be fair, or maybe rack spaces, but it had very, very little lock, standard power. The Sora was really great, but I got to a point with it really where I couldn't kind of move forwards with it because I'd kind of I was pushing this car to the extreme and, and way beyond. Once I got in an S body, I kind of realized what the S body chassis was all about. And even being in a sort of fairly stock 14, I could see it was it was very nimble, it was very quick at transitioning, and I kind of sort of realized that if I wanted to go really quick on the track, probably an, an S body or something like that was going to be a better solution than a Sora. You can make a Sora go quick, but ultimately they're very heavy cars, and to get them really quick and really grippy, you've got to spend an absolute fortune. At this point, I still had the JZX90. I was kind of doing a few bits to it on the side, but it wasn't really sort of really moving. Um, and a chap called Hugo, he actually put up a really cool S15, the black one, which you guys know that I own now, the D1SL one. He put that up, up for sale, saying that um, he kind of... Yeah, he didn't really want to kind of skid it. He thought the car was a bit nice and he was looking to do a, a swap on a on a project. And obviously I had my JZ X90, it was kind of a project at the time. And we managed to do a straight swap. I'm just gonna take the old girl for a little run up the road. Maybe let John have a quick little go. Good. Once again, don't need to really go through the 15. Obviously, you guys know all about that car, and that's when I really started to kind of drive very hard on the track. <laughs>
really kind of started to learn sort of more advanced tracks and going a lot faster. I started practicing backwards entries. <laughs> problems with the car and it really held me back from drifting because as much as I wanted to get the seat time and I was putting the time into actually going to the events, the car wasn't actually up to scratch so it was kind of holding me back. <laughs> <laughs> what happened, bro? My car set fire. <laughs> Are you happy? No. <laughs> <laughs> Only sad is kaput. We have a rather big split in said boost pipe. Duggets. <laughs> Fucking hell, man. I think they're looking for John. Luckily for me, obviously, Mr. Dave, Garage 21, love you, man. He got on board and kind of helped me get the car to a level where I could actually go and use it reliably. This is going to involve quite a big wall ride. <laughs>
obviously I had the big crash at Driftland. A bit strange that can I kind of got flack for it, but I mean anyone that knows cars can clearly see rather than me going into um, Harry, I actually made evasive action and managed to go up the bank. <laughs> That's when I decided to kind of pull back, which you guys saw last year. And then I started um, really putting my time into my merchandise. I made a new website and I started making all my own custom merchandise. I'm hoping that this year, or certainly over the next year, I can kind of sell enough of these lovely goods to you guys. And then hopefully that will give me the finances I need to really get back out on the track. Anyway, I am digressing massively. So what are we on to now? That was the S15. Then obviously I bought the uh, JZX100 Mark II, which you guys obviously know about, off, um, off Andy at Power Vehicles. He did me a very good deal on that in exchange for a bit of promotion. <laughs> Fensport, absolutely love them. They're very kindly getting behind the car now and helping me finish it, so I'm excited to kind of get that out on the track. I wasn't actually going to drift that car because it was a little bit too expensive and I was trying to protect my investment. We're obviously, with Fensport behind me now, I'm a little bit less scared of doing so. Um, so that's going to be the long-term plan with the JZX, is just to try and finish it, um, get it on the road, get it running, and then we're going to take it to a few practice days and just see what it's like to, to drift. Then we've got the white S15. Seven, which you guys have obviously seen. Also missed the Civic as well. You guys have seen the Civic on the channel, the B18 Turbo. We've got launch control. Oh my god! It's, ter it's gonna go terribly wrong, viewers.
also missed the Corolla, which we've now got for Georgie. Obviously my Volvo, my Ovlov, that's just my daily run around. I've had that for quite a few years now and I absolutely love it. My favorite car in the fleet, facts. Oh, I've also got the Vauxhall Calibra. the Mazda RX-7 FC. God, I'm not very good at this. Sorry if I'm messing the whole order up, but like I said, I've had so many freaking cars, I actually can't remember them. I actually bought this. I've had another S2000. That's actually where I got the number plate. It was literally the worst S2000 in the world. It looked all right from 10 meters. have it though that is a basic rundown of the last sort of 15 years of my car life i'm actually quite interested to see what cars you have had previously yourself if you guys want to jump onto my facebook page and send me a little message feel free just chuck me a few pictures of your car tell me what car it is and the modifications and any sort of funny stories you've got like i said i'll do my best to speak about all of them but if you don't see your car in the episode obviously don't get mad i can only do what i can another cool thing we're going to do after that is a q a so i'm going to do a q a on patreon i'm going to get all the patrons to ask me questions if you want to join up on patreon and ask some questions feel free um, and then I'll actually read them out in the video and go through all the answers. So that should be pretty fun. Anyway, I hope you guys have enjoyed this slightly different episode today. Feel free to kind of chuck some comments down below if you'd like to see any sort of more um, sort of talking content. I'm going to be doing lots of um, simulator stuff as well. So expect a few videos with the old Fasaro bad boy pretty soon. As always, hope you enjoyed the video. And I look forward to seeing you guys tomorrow. La, 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 la.